Utrecht Medical Center and their joint animal welfare body. My name is Monique Janssens. Uh, I'm the communications consultant of the animal welfare body Utrecht. I will ask you please to uh, turn off your camera and your sound um, until the moment of questions so that we have optimal uh, vision and sound. After each presentation, there will be a short moment for questions. Uh, because we are not many, I don't think it's necessary to use the chat. Uh, you can just put your camera on, your sound on and start talking. Please keep your questions short. Um, we will have two presentations today. Um, the first one is by Ellen Meyer, uh, Utrecht University, and um, I think, Ellen, you can now start sharing your screen. Then I will tell uh, very shortly what it's about, your presentation. Ellen will talk about uh, research aimed at developing a simu pig, and Ellen will tell me whether I pronounced that, that right which is a model to teach venipuncture in pigs. Uh, please, Ellen, um, you can proceed. Yeah, thank you for so much uh, for your introduction and also for the opportunity to tell something about my uh, project. Um, yeah, as you already explained, my name is Ellen Meijer. Um, I am an assistant professor at the Animal Behavior Group of Saskia Arendt from January this year. And before that, I worked at the uh, large animal department for eight years. Um, yeah, this project I already received the funding for in uh, 2017. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I sometimes call it my Murphy project because uh, uh, a few things uh, that went wrong were uh, that delayed the project. So I will go into that a bit more uh, later on in the presentation. So I'm afraid I have no real finished project to show you guys or uh, uh, data to present. But I thought it instead I might give you just an overview of uh, the reason why we wanted to do this project, um, the steps that we took uh, to, uh, to move forward. Uh, and also where we are now, and maybe I could share some uh, tips and tricks in the in the process for the people that may want to um, uh, apply for a grant, and um, and they might find that helpful. And otherwise, it might be a sort of a easy way to uh, ease you into the uh, rest of the talks, which may be a bit more complex. But we can then start out maybe a bit more uh, relaxed and um, basic. So a little bit of history. Um, this project I uh, got from uh, a colleague called Lucia Dieste. She moved on to another uh, uh, job in uh, the GD in Deventer and she asked me, hey, I have this, uh, this project that I want to do where I want to make a venipuncture model for pigs. Um, I don't have any funding yet, but I do already know a company that may be able to do it. Would you like to take this over for me? And I immediately said yes. Um, mainly because uh, I had at that point been t trying to teach at least uh, students uh, to do venipuncture in pigs for many years. Um, and I still, despite of that, uh, I had a lot of uh, experience in that. I still found it one of the most difficult things to teach in practical uh, teaching. Um, I will get into why that is so difficult a bit later on in the presentation, but um, at least um, yeah, I, I found it very challenging and I thought, uh, well, if we can find something to make it a bit more easy on the pig and maybe also on the people, that would be really nice. So um, first, I want to explain a little bit about the procedure itself for the people that are not familiar with it. Um, now, you see a picture of what it should look like when you're uh, successful. Um, yeah, why would we want to do uh, venipuncture in pigs? Uh, the blunt uh, answer is either to get blood out or to get something in. Um, getting blood out is, um, in clinical practice at least, uh, mostly used for diagnostics and then mostly for uh, infectious diseases. As you may know, pigs are kept in really large groups um, where the individuals don't have much uh, monetary value uh, themselves. So the focus is mainly on keeping the uh, groups healthy and a big part of that is screening for and um, ruling out infectious diseases so that's uh, one of the main reasons for drawing blood in pigs 
Um, in research, you may also want to know uh, more about uh, uh, some other markers, biomarkers, or you may want to take cells out. Um, if you uh, are a vet and you encounter a pig that is a, actually a pet animal, then you may also want to do a little more uh, elaborate diagnostics. So those are all reasons to want to draw blood from a pig. You could also do a venipuncture to get something into a pig. In practice, that's not used often. Um, the only um, yeah, exception being euthanasia. In euthanasia, sometimes the lethal substance is injected uh, intravenously. But um, and in research settings, of course, that's done more often as well. So uh, researchers and uh, technicians may want to be able to do this, but uh, most people that we teach are uh, people aspiring to be veterinarians. And we think they should all be able to draw blood from a pig. So that's why we teach it in the uh, master curriculum. Uh, they have a week there in the intramural clinic where they are allowed to select a pig on the farm that is ill. Uh, they take the pig to the clinic. Uh, they can run all kinds of diagnostics on the pig. And um, um, at the end of the week, they should be able to uh, formulate a uh, tentative diagnosis. Uh, then they euthanize the pig. They can do pathology on it. And then they see if they were correct in very, very short. Um, so at that point, either by doing diagnostics or otherwise uh, at the, in the euthanasia protocol, that's for most of them the first time they have to uh, withdraw uh, blood from a pig or uh, inject something into the vein. And that's why we try at that point, we try to teach them that. Well, what exactly do we teach them then? Um, this is the location where we uh, teach them to draw blood. It's either the right uh, jugular vein or uh, the cranial uh, vena cava. Um, it's not always possible to distinguish those two, and I will explain later why that is. Um, so that's the, uh, the location. You could also draw blood from the ear if you wanted to, but you cannot get large volumes out. So for practical reasons, we teach uh, the puncture in the neck. Um, the people here at this picture are doing it right because they're doing it at the right side of the pig, so left for the observer. That's because at the left side uh, there's uh, some structures that may be damaged if you uh, insert the needle there, for example, the phrenic nerve or the thoracic duct. Now, in short, what we do, we uh, stick the needle through the vein, then we apply negative pressure or suction on the, uh, on the plunger of the syringe, and then we slowly advance the um, the needle and once we hit the vein then uh, blood will flow into the syringe. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, in practice it's not so straightforward. Um, in contrast to most other animals where we uh, do venipuncture, um, like dogs or uh, cows or horses or even humans, um, in pigs you cannot see the vein um, because it's really deep within all the uh, muscular tissue in the neck. So uh, you cannot see it, you can also not feel it, and you can also not occlude it. Usually we occlude the vein uh, proximal to where we stick the needle, so the uh, vein will be raised and then it's easier to feel it and also to, to insert the needle into that. In pigs that's not possible. So it's really like we call it a blind stick. Um, you have to visualize the anatomy, um, and you, as you can see sometimes we uh, fixate the pig upside down, which makes it even more difficult to do that. Um, and then hope that the anatomy is uh, the way it should be, um, that the, the pig read the book and uh, you can actually insert the needle at the right place. And then we just advance the needle and, uh, and see if we collect blood. If we don't, we withdraw a little bit and then change the angle a little bit and try again. Well, that's already stressful for students and for the pig as well, but for, students find it really difficult we can, because they cannot see where they have to... Uh, uh, where they have to stick the needle. Uh, then again, also pigs are very difficult to fixate. Even the small ones that you see here, they are uh, really strong. You wouldn't expect it. Uh, and they will wriggle to, uh, to break free. So relying still is not really an option for them. Um, and it says here that pigs vocalize uh, loudly. I think that's uh, mildly put because uh, pigs can really, really scream. And in big pigs, you need ear protection because otherwise you will be deaf. Um, so uh, all that makes it very, very difficult for the students, especially for the first time. 
And that results in uh, longer fixation times for the pigs. Uh, of course, they first they have to see and then they ask us, is this the right place? We say yes, okay, or no, you have to move up a bit or go lower a bit. Um, so the fixation time is longer, which is stressful for the pig. Once they students insert the needle and they do not get blood uh, immediately, they will have to withdraw the needle a little bit and then change the angle, which is also uh, painful for the pig. Um, and if they're in the wrong place altogether, they may have to withdraw the needle and uh, do a second attempt at puncture. So all these things uh, cause stress and pain for the pig. And the more inexperienced uh, the person is, usually the, the more stress and, uh, and pain for the pig. And also we see that uh, adverse events like uh, hematomas or a puncture of structures that should not be punctured are more common in inexperienced operators. So that results in stress for uh, mainly the pigs, but also for students and also for teachers, because of course uh, all of us want to do it right and um, uh, it's not, not fun to have to inflict pain or stress on an animal. So it would be really nice if you can facilitate that process so we are better the students are better prepared uh, when they attempt a venipuncture on a live pig. So we thought maybe the solution may be a model pig to practice on. The model will probably not completely mimic the situation in a live pig and um, maybe should not also not be made to do that, but at least allow for practice of some of the technical aspects of venipuncture, like correct positioning, applying structure and, uh, and uh, yeah, moving the needle forward. So that's what we set out to do. We wanted to make a model that at least simulates most uh, technical aspects. Now, what, uh, we made a list of the things that we really wanted out of the model. We wanted palpable landmarks. As I said, the vein itself cannot be palpated, but uh, there are some landmarks like bony structures or uh, the trachea that can be felt and will at least help visualize uh, in what direction the vein is traveling. Um, also, what we found really important is that it felt realistically when we puncture structures. You can imagine if you puncture the skin, that feels different than uh, puncturing a fatty tissue or uh, uh, hitting a bone or anything like that. So that feel and the consistency of uh, the structures was important for us. Um, and we really wanted to model that as well. Um, also, we really would like to have real-time feedback in the sense that once the students arrive at the correct location with the needle that they will know, either through a sound signal or a, um, a light turning on, or maybe actually being able to withdraw blood or fake blood. Um, so that, because that also helps the learning experience for them that they really see, okay, this is, now I'm doing it right. And we wanted to be able to uh, model both the jugular vein and the cranial vena cava puncture uh, if possible. Well, um, Lucia had already found a company that may be able to do that. Um, it's called Forma Fundo, and uh, they make educational models. And as you can see, they already made a venue puncture model for the dog, uh, which has um, basically the same principle, only this is a vein that is also occludable and, um, and you can feel and um, see. And it has uh, fake blood attached to it, so uh, students can actually withdraw blood from the model. Um, they also have a uh, endotracheal intubation uh, model, also of a dog that you see here. And if I'm correct, they also have a bladder catheterization model also for a dog. So these are all dog models, but the technique they thought would work equally well in pigs. So they were willing to, uh, to try that. So well, we're all set to go and I had received the funding. So uh, I thought, okay, let's move forward. And then came the completion of all the legal paperwork. And this was really something I had not anticipated on how long this would take. Um, so that's really something I want to tell people that may be inexper as inexperienced as I was at uh, working with external companies, that this is really something to consider when planning. Uh, the idea that we had was that we uh, wanted to use the money uh, to uh, let the producer uh, develop the model. And then they would get intellectual property. We would get uh, three models and they would get intellectual property. So they could also market the model, which was, would be nice because then other parties would also be able to use it and maybe uh, refine uh, their experiments or their teaching. 
but that proved to be really difficult to uh, to legally uh, catch into uh, paperwork. Uh, fortunately, we had our uh, business developer Vincent Reisman on board to help us with that, and that was really necessary because that you need specialists for that. Um, also, of course, the, all the manufacturing procedures had to be protected for the uh, for the manufacturer themselves. So, well, that was uh, fairly difficult. Then also, um, we were going to model the uh, uh, going to make the the model uh, after a real life pig. So we in a uh, real dead pig in the end. Um, so we um, had to find a pig and transport it and then transport it to the company once it was euthanized. And that was also a bit of a, a, a hassle because you need uh, permission from the Dutch Food and Consumer Product Safety Authority. And uh, they don't usually uh, get requests to, re to transport one dead pig. So it was really hard to fill in all the forms and get that all stamped. But um, in the end, that all worked. But this was the part that took most time. But in the end, we got that uh, all uh, together and then we could finally move on to the next phase. And that was finding a suitable model pig. So, and in model pig here, I mean a pig that we could make the model after. So we needed one real pig um, of the right size, um, the same size as the pigs that we use in our teaching which is about 10 weeks old um, or even smaller. And um, an animal that had no anatomical abnormalities and that we could use the nice and then uh, use for this purpose. And here we um, really had a lot of help from the animal welfare body and in particular Wim de Leeuw, um, who was very helpful in thinking about all the possibilities to obtain such an animal without um, needlessly euthanizing a healthy pig. Um, so as really my uh, other point of advice would be for anyone in this kind of situation to really enlist their help early on in the stage uh, of your uh, project, because uh, to me, this was really helpful. Well, fortunately, we found a pig that had been used for teaching purposes uh, and who had uh, met the right requirements. And then we could get to work. Well, maybe as you understand, I cannot explain the, uh, into detail the procedure as this is the um, yeah, owned by the company that makes the model. Um, but I would like to give you a short impression of what it actually looked like. Um, this is our uh, pig. We pre-medicated and induced it with a commercially available combination of uh, zolazepam and tilotamine. Um, we had IV access uh, through the auricular veins, so we could use uh, propofol uh, for continuation of the anesthesia and e deepening if necessary. Uh, we established arterial access through uh, the femoral arteries, and then uh, we uh, administered heparin uh, to uh, uh, to make the blood clot less and facilitate bleeding. We flushed with sterile fund in, and then we bled the pig while simultaneously infusing the fixation fluid. So then the the pig was ready to be transported to uh, to the company for further processing. Here are some detail pictures here. You see the two auricular veins that have been um, catheterized. So we had IV access. And here we started to prepare the, um, the uh, artery. So this is the vein and uh, below that is the artery. Which was uh, even, well, it was more difficult than we expected. And also it sort of uh, illustrated to us why it is so difficult to do a venipuncture because these uh, veins and arteries are both fairly uh, reactive to, to touch. Well, this is the stage that we are in now. Uh, we modeled only the front side of the pig uh, because that's all we need. And also it's really expensive to these materials to make it are really expensive. Um, so this is the actual fake pig that uh, is going to be uh, further uh, uh, refined. Uh, the palpable structures have all been molded. Um, and what happened is, I'm not sure if you can see my um, pointer on the screen, but um, you will see a square will be cut out here uh, from the skin. And then the uh, artificial plate the veins will be placed uh, in the right direction. And come out at the uh, back side and then we can fill it with artificial blood. Um, 
these veins are commercially available, so we can also replace them once they are um, punctured many times. I think they can be punctured for about 50 times before they have to be replaced. And also the skin inset, so the, the part that we can take out to replace the veins, is also going to be replaceable because you can imagine if students have punctured that like uh, a lot of times, then also you may want to replace it. So that's all still has to be done as we taken out and then made replaceable. So that's where we are at now. I think it looks fairly realistic if I uh, see it uh, like this. And this week I will see it in uh, in real life too. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll have the first model available in September. Um, and ideally, I would really like to evaluate if the model actually does what it's supposed to do, because we could just start using it and then never know if it actually is helpful or not. So I would like to uh, collect some data on that as well. Now, ideally, I would split the group of students in half to and half of them could practice on the model first and other half not. But I'm not uh, entirely sure if I actually find that uh, uh, ethically acceptable because both from the viewpoint from the pick that gets untrained students while they can there is a practice opportunity available but also from the viewpoint of students who may not get to practice and we have the whole learning experience so i'm not entirely sure yet how i'm going to do that but i would like to get some data on them at least um, and then i would like at least uh, some objective and some subjective parameters like uh, the time it takes until successful puncture and uh, blood withdrawal, also the number of attempts needed. There are any adverse events in uh, both groups of pigs, but also on the subjective experience for students and the teacher. And I would, of course, uh, like to, to know something about the reason we started the whole project. Uh, is this actually lessening the stress for the pig? So measuring, for example, heart rate or behavior or using uh, thermography to uh, say something about uh, the stress in pigs and if it actually is less when we uh, have uh, students train on the model before. So this is still I'm still thinking about how I'm going to do that and anyone who has experience in this or who has any uh, good ideas is very welcome to provide me with some uh, ideas or feedback. Also, I would like to say if anybody's interested in this model for uh, any of their own educational purposes, uh, feel free to contact me because, um, yeah, well, I would like to have them used as much as possible. So uh, please let me know if you are interested and, uh, and uh, I will try to help. With this, I would like to uh, conclude my talk. I would like to shortly mention these people that were really of tremendous help during the whole project. Richard Lentes of Forma Funda, Wim de Leeuw helped find a uh, suitable pick, Lucia Diest, of course, who laid the foundations of the whole project, uh, the Porcelain Health Group of the Farm Animal Department, who provided me with uh, input for what they wanted in the model, and of course, the funding agency for uh, providing me with the money to do this. Uh, I would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ellen, for this uh, wonderful and very interesting talk. I'm happy to hear that the grant has been uh, very useful to you. And I think uh, that, yeah, that you're doing wonderful work. Um, are there any questions? We have a few minutes left for questions. I see Jan and Pascal have a question. Um, Jan, could you start, please? Yeah, thank you, Ellen. It looks like a, a real nice model. Um, I, I have two questions, and they are around the same subject. That mm -hmm. you're, you're going to puncture the new model, yeah. Um, so it will be punctured lots of times. Will that not, in 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 the long run, damage the model, so that you have to buy a new, probably expensive model? Yeah. And, and the second uh, question related to that one: if you puncture it several times, you may see where the at some point where the needle entered the model, so it will be an example for other students and they won't learn anything anymore. Yeah, now are, those are two very valid points. Uh, for the first one, uh, durability, we uh, the veins, there's two things that may be damaged, like the skin and the veins. The veins that we use are actually uh, uh, commercially available uh, veins that are used in human mannequins. So they can puncture, be punctured about 50 times, uh, if I remember correctly, and then can be replaced. So you don't have to replace the entire model, but only the veins. Um, and for the skin, yeah, you are partly right that uh, yeah, if they puncture enough times at the same spot, 
uh, the students will see uh, where other students have punctured. We use really thin needles, but uh, yeah, still that may be possible after a long time. But also in the real <laughs> model, um, we don't, uh, or in the real pig, um, there are several spots that you can actually insert the needle. So you can go a bit higher or a bit lower on the neck. That doesn't really matter as long as you're in the right, um, if you follow the course of the vein. Okay. Directly. So it's more about the direction and, and knowing, visualizing where the vein will travel through the structures than if you're a centimeter higher or lower. So, well, we could still uh, have students in either sit uh, the puncture on the same spot or um, going a bit lower or higher and still finding it useful. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next is Pascal, please. Uh, well, thank you. Alan, it was really interesting uh, uh, talk. I have a um, well, maybe a completely different question, and hopefully it's a little bit your expertise. But you mentioned that if if you have to uh, uh, venipuncture a live pig, that it is uh, very difficult to restrain it and to uh, uh, and that it will will yell. And I was wondering whether it would be able to train the animals to cooperate yeah. with you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, and and for research purposes, we do that. Uh, yeah, we do that. So uh, if you have one or maybe 10 or 20 pigs, you can do that. But in a farm with uh, 20,000 pigs, then that gets more difficult. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, it's very much possible because pigs are very, very trainable. So uh, yeah, I think you can either train them to stand still or even to hang in a hammock. That has also been done. And then uh, to, uh, to do the puncture. But uh, yeah, that's more for research purposes than it's in practical uh, circumstances. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question I see is from Philip. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I have more than uh, more uh, uh, recommendations or suggestions than, than questions. Oh, nice. First suggestion is on my first question is uh, uh, have you contacted Professor René Remy because he has done more or less the same in a rat? No, I don't. Uh, Solve pharmaceuticals. Uh, I think Pascal or uh, Fritz uh, can help you or can also give you the contact data of Professor René Remy. Oh, that so would be nice. The same for the the Philip Pincher in in rats. Mm -hmm. um, and a second, yeah, of course I know that you are making this model for teaching students for in veterinary practice. But I don't know if you're familiar with uh, systems that are used in the humane medicine. Uh, it's called uh, the AccuVane. It's a technique using uh, near uh, infrared uh, signal to visualize the veins of a human person. Yeah. Try it once in mice. It can be helpful in albino mice, but you cannot use it in pigmented mice. So I don't know the situation in pigs because, of course, the veins are more deeper than uh, compared to the veins in the arm of a human patient. Yeah, it would be it's also it would an be interesting nice. route to, to find out. Uh, yeah. I think that maybe uh, maybe in really small piglets, because uh, usually, usually they're not pigmented, so uh, that those may be useful. Mm. But I think yeah. in bigger pigs, yeah, we, we use needles that are this long. Yeah, no, yeah. You have to go through the fat needle and uh, the fat tissue, and, and so and of maybe course, not, but maybe for yeah. smaller piglets, yeah. yeah. Of course, also you have also the the Pietrin <laughs> breeds in mm -hmm. Belgium, famous. So they are also yeah. pigmented. Maybe that's not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that becomes more difficult. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Thanks for your suggestions. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, now it's time to move on to the next presentation. Ellen, thank you very much. Please uh, stay with us and ask uh, some nice questions to, <laughs> to the next speaker. I'll try to. <laughs> this is uh, Chi Cheng Ye. He is also from Utrecht University. You can start sharing your screen now. Um, his talk is about an animal free hydrogel for human organite cultures. Please can go. you hear me now? Thank you. Yes, we can hear. And can you see my PowerPoint? Okay. Thanks yes. for your introduction. Shall I start? Okay. Good. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shi Cheng, a second year PhD student from Liver Group and the supervision of Bart and Kirsten. Today, I'm going to share our recent publication about an animal free hydrogel for human organoid culture. During the past one year, I have been working on this animal free, chemically defined hydrogel, and luckily, it, everything goes on so well, and all results on this hydrogel has been uh, accepted in the Journal of Advanced Functional Materials early this month. So the topic today is uh, animal-free hydrogel for human organoid culture. Firstly, what are organoids? Organoids are mean each organs that resemble their organs of origin in respect to cell types and functions. And organoids can be derived from a variety of organs and species. Nowadays, organoids have various applications, including high throughput drug screening and disease modeling. As such, organoids are promising as in vitro models to replace in vivo experiments with ad experimental animals. Current organoid culture highly depends on the use of matrigel as 3D scaffold. Matrigel is made from most tumor, and it takes around 20 months to make only one bottle of matrigel. The amount of matrigel used in our group alone will cost two to three thousand experimental mass. Take into account other groups using matrigel for organoid culture. Millions of mass will be sacrificed every year worldwide, and this contradicts with the use of organoids to replace animal exp experimental animals. Therefore, we were wondering if we can use some synthetic hydrogel to replace matrigel for organoid culture. As we know, matrigel can provide suitable mechanical properties and it also contains various bioactive proteins to support organoid proliferation. So to mimic those functions, we use the combination of thermosensitive polyacetylene peptides and bioactive proteins lamin intactin complex, in short, LEC. In this study, we use the human stem cell-derived liver organoid as the cell source. Human liver organoid is a single layer epithelial cell and it can form a holosphere from single cells. Firstly, we see single cells in different hydrogels. And you can see here, organoids cultured in PIC LEC hydrogels is comparable to that in matrigel. Well, PIC without LEC is not sufficient. Later, we want to test the effects of polymer lens on organoid expansion. We tried two molecular lens of PSA, one key dorsal and the five key dorsal, and test the different concentration of PSA on the organoid proliferation. And you can see that organoids cultured in the lower concentration of PSA grew bigger than those in higher concentration of PSA. After this, we further tested the dose effect of LEC on organoid expansion and found that with the higher concentration of LEC, organoids can proliferate better. Further, we did the we quantified the cell proliferation and checked that the confirmed this dose dependent influence and found that. The optimized RE, PSC REC hydrogel observed a, a tested and comparable field change relative to matrigel. Here we already know that lower concentration of PSC can support better organoid expansion. We were wondering whether salt hydrogel is better for organoid proliferation. So we further tested the mechanical properties of different hydrogels. Here, the storage modulus is a key indicator of stiffness. 
when it is lower than one pascal, it's more like a liquid. And when the modulo is here, it becomes a gel. So in this study, you can see here with the temperature raising up, all different hydrogels become solids. And the optimized the PIC LEC hydrogel showed uh, the lowest the stiffness, which means that compared with metro and other uh, hydrogels, this hydrogel is the most uh, softest. As PIC is a synthetic polymer and the thermal reversible, so we also measure the thermal reversible re reversibility of different hydrogels. First, the black curve stands for the temperature, and the red one represents the stiffness. You can see with the temperature raising up, all hydrogels become a firm gel, and when the temperature goes down, hydrogels do hold a st stiffness around 50 Pascal, while PSC hydrogels become a liquid again upon the cooling down. So those results suggest that soft PSC hydrogel can enhance the organoid expansion, and they are easy to work with due to their thermal reversibility. Now that we, are, we know the mechanical properties of different hydrogels, we also need to verify that organoids captured in those hydrogels can retain their biological characteristics. Firstly, we tested several uh, proteins. For example, the epithelial marker E cation and the dietal marker keratin 19. You can see in those staining, organoids cultured in different hydrogels are all positive for the epithelial marker, e and keratin-19. They also highly express the proliferative markers, P PCAN and the KI67. Those are from the protein level. We also tested the gene expression levels with mRNA sequencing. You can see here, organoids cultured in different hydrogels are closely comparable to each other with a coherence higher than 99%. Furthermore, we selected the most representative markers and compared with human liver or human hepatosis. Organoids cultured in different hydrogels highly express the stem cell and the progenitor markers, including LGFL and proliferative markers. But they are low express the functional or material hepatocyte markers. Those results show that organoids in the cultured in PSC retain their stem cell phenotype and are highly proliferative. But furthermore, we want to we, we were wondering whether organoids can also be differentiated into functional hepatocytes in those hydrogels. So we did the exper differentiate experiment. Compared with organoids cultured in expansion medium, organoids cultured in differentiate medium showed a dark and condensed morphology. QPCR showed that compared with the EM conditions, the stem cell marker LGR5 is downregulated in all DM conditions. Well, the functional markers of hepatocytes, such as albumin CIF3A4 and MRP2, are all regulated in the DM conditions, which showed a well differentiation state. Functional hepatocytes express the multi-drug resistant protein MDR1, which can transport rhodamine into the epicocyte, which is inside the lumen of organoids. So you can see here, the rhodamine, has, which is green, has been transported into the lumen, the inside of organoids in all different hydrogels. Well, in the control group, which has been treated with varapamil, and varapamil is an inhibitor of MDR1. Then the trans this transport is inhibited. This confirms the specific transportation with MDR1. 
functional hypothesis can also eliminate ammonia. So we also measure the ammonia elimination in different hydrogels and the comparable levels were observed. Furthermore, we also measure the intracellular proteins and those, those proteins are key proteins of the functional hypothesis. For example, the serum protein albumin and the Euron circle related GLDH. And you can see that the organoids cultured in different hydrogels express comparable levels of those proteins. Those results show that the differentiated hypothesis like cells are functional in PSA. We continued the culture for long term and showed that organoids cultured in different hydrogel are still functional for at least the four months. Not that we already achieved very good results. However, this chemically defined hydrogel is not totally animal free. So we further tried to use human recombinant lemony 11 to replace the animal derived LEC. And you can see here, the human recombinant lemony 11 also showed a dose dependent effect as LEC with the higher concentration of lemony pro provide the better environment for organoids expansion. Then to confirm that organoids cultured in human recombinant lemony 11 also maintain their epithelial phenotype. We also did the immunofluorescence staining. And you can see organoids cultured in this PSC human recombinant lemony 11 hydrogel are also positive for the epithelial marker ecatarin and keratin-19. Those organoids also highly express the proliferative marker PCAN and the KS67. So those results uh, show that human recombinant lemony 11 can replace LEC for the organoid expansion. Here is the main result of this research. And to summarize, in this study, we have developed an animal free material for organoid culture. And this PSC hydrogel is chemically defined and thermal reversible, which makes it easier to work with. Organoids cultured in PSC hydrogels can proliferate as efficient as in metrogel, and organoids can also be differentiated into functional hypothesis like cells. During the long-term culture, organoids are still functional in all different hydrogels. If other organotypes can, if this hydrogel can be applied to other organotypes, millions of masts will be reduced every year. However, due to as human recombinant lemony 11 is still relatively expensive, so for the future studies, we will focus on the replacements of human recombinant lemony 11 so that the cost to make this synthetic hydrogel will be significantly reduced, then making it uh, possible for the large scale application of this animal free measure alternative. At last, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to this project. And this project is mainly supported by the NWWINI and the 3 v Fund to Kirsten. Johan is the master study student who had worked on this hydrogel in the very beginning. And uh, Dr. Marco helped with the geological measurements. And Frank helped with the MR16 analysis. Monique and Luz helped with the QPSR and the staining. Thank you all for your attention. And now I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Shi Cheng, for this wonderful presentation. I think uh, I'm really impressed. This is really good news for for so many uh, animals for the for the complete uh, animal reduction movement. So, yeah, thank you. Um, we will take questions now. Are there any questions? 
I, th I see uh, Philip's hand is still up, but, but I'm not sure. Is this still up or is it a new question, Philip? Uh, Jan, you have a question? Yeah, uh, Shi Cheng, I find it uh, real nice to hear you talk and I'm looking forward to read your paper because it's quite important that we start replacing the battery gel because it's, it's a real serious problem. And if you can make your new model more cheaper as well, that will help a lot. Um, I think I missed it, but maybe you told it. I don't know. Are, are there any biological products in there? So, so is it to totally animal free or are there still animal products in your uh, in your gel? Uh, thanks for your question, Joan. In the very beginning, we used the uh, hydrogel. This is chemically defined, but still with animal products, which is called LEC. So in the latest stage, we replaced the, the animal throughout the LEC with the human recombinant lemonin 101, which okay. is bioactive and uh, totally animal free. And that makes it also more human relevant if you do human related studies. Yes, exactly. Oh, great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Pascal is the next one who has a question. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for, for your uh, talk. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question on uh, the reproducibility of making the, uh, the, the batches of, ma of matter gel. Um, are you, um, how reproducible is it when you, when you make the different batches? And are you planning of um, maybe uh, contacting... Uh, 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 a company that will do that content. Is the question clear to you, Shi Chiang? Uh, we cannot. Uh, thanks for your questions. I want to confirm that if you are asking if this chemical animal free hydrogel is uh, reproducible compared with matter gel or. Yes, yeah, so it, does it have the exact same content? So when you when you use it in different experiments that you know that the content of the matter gel is exactly the same. Okay. Uh, if, if, yeah, so if you make one batch, you can use it, and then when it's finished, you make a new batch, and you have to be sure that this, the two batches are exactly the same. So. Yeah, actually what you mentioned is another advantage of our animal-free chemical defined hydrogel. Because many pe people who have working with match gel know that there are big batch to batch variations with the match gel because the, con the proteins inside the match gel is not uh, very clear. And uh, so, and it's also uh, extracted from most tumor. But this chemically defined hydrogel is already commercially available and it's it's synthetic, okay. it's, yeah, it's synthetic, so it's really easy to reproduce and easy to work with compared with match gel. Okay, I understood that you made it yourself, but you, you bought it. It's commercially available. Yeah. Okay, okay. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. The next question is from Kerstin. Yes, thank you, Cheng, for your presentation. Uh, maybe I can uh, add one comment to the previous question. So we bought the backbone, the uh, PIC, but then functionalized it because it's uh, inert. It doesn't have any, uh, doesn't contain any biological, uh, biologically active compounds. So we biofunctionalized it with uh, LEC or later human recombinant laminin. But we bought the backbone, yeah. And uh, then my question was, you said in your, on your last slide, Xi Cheng, that um, uh, by replacing full-length human recombinant laminin with peptides, we could mm -hmm. reduce costs by about 60-fold. Yeah. Uh, so then the, the price that we end up, I don't know if you know, but do you know how the price uh, will compare to Matogel? If, if we succeed with the peptides, will it be approximately the same price as Matogel or will it still be more expensive or might it even be cheaper? 
Uh, thanks for addition to the former questions and uh, thanks for very important new questions. It's quite important for us to work with hydrogels. And uh, actually, I have calculated the process formally, but uh, I don't remember its demand, but uh, I, I as I remember that uh, the reduced, uh, I mean, if the the cost will be reduced, it will be comparable to Metrager. Yeah, but it want to be even ch cheaper, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, okay, I'm, I myself have a question. Um, Shi Cheng, do you have any idea how much time it will take before the gel could be in on the market be, before it's really available uh, yeah for for an acceptable price so that people will start using it yeah as uh, we have mentioned or Christian had mentioned that this uh, the the backbone of this uh, hydrogel is already commercially available so everybody can purchase it from the company and uh, the use of this hydrogel also depends on the cell types you are culturing. So for in our study, we functionalize this backbone with the LEC or later human recombinant lamni one one But for other cell types, it uh, may be interesting to try other human recombinant uh, proteins. Okay, but, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? Someone I missed, maybe? Um, Kerstin again, yes? Uh, just to add on that, uh, I think we, um, um, yeah, of course, we want to have it commercially available for a, for a large amount of consumers as soon as possible, but I think we should also be uh, realistic. That's why we also mentioned that now it's really much more like about 60 fold more expensive than major gel, so it won't be used on large scale yet. And um, yeah, we, we have started like a new project synthesizing gels with the uh, peptides, but before it's really uh, validated, made validated, and then on the market, I think yeah, it will take, I don't know, but probably uh, a few years, well, one to three years, I would say, something like that maybe, but maybe that's even an underestimation, maybe it's even longer, but um, so yeah, but I think that's still a very important first step. But, but if researchers are really principled about animal use, they, they could use it. Yeah, sure. It's right just now. much more expensive right now. Yeah. Uh, but, much, uh, much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I see. Yeah. yeah. And it's questions? not only for uh, animal uh, replacement, it's also for researchers that work on translation of organoids say, into uh, the clinics. Huh? So if you want to uh, apply organoids for transplantations or tissue engineering studies, you have to use a uh, synthetic FDA approved hydrogel. And for that, it's also a big advantage to have a synthetic and completely defined hydrogel because major gel, of course, uh, you won't be able to use major gel in uh, human clinics. Yeah, okay, I see. Um, no, I, I think I see no more questions, am I right? Other, if anyone has a question now, they can come to the forward. No? Okay, and in that case, I want to thank you all for joining us, especially the speakers. Thank you very much. Um, if uh, um, people would like to attend next uh, uh, coming Friday as well, and you, if you haven't subscribed yet, you just uh, let us know and you will receive a link in, uh, in, in a new calendar item. Our speakers then will be uh, Martijn Evers from the University Medical Center Utrecht about uh, getting nanoparticles in the right place in mice uh, with much fewer mice than before. And uh, Claudia Wolschrein from Utrecht University about soft plastination and especially the question how to show air sacs in birds, which will normally collapse if you put them in a, a plastinate. Um, for now, uh, thank you once more. Have a good day and keep safe. See you hopefully on Friday. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye.